we have today with us Richard Gere and Suresh Krishnan. Richard uh, Gee is um, from Red Hat, and Suresh Krishnan is the CTO of Kaloom. And uh, they're going to walk us through the emerging use of containers and OpenShift and telco networks today. And I'll let them introduce themselves, and um, then we'll um, open up the, the call afterwards um, for a conversation about um, this topic or anything else that you're, you'd be interested in. So, um, Shuresh and Richard, why don't you um, kick us off here? Sure. Hey, let's go ahead. I'll uh, introduce myself after. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, hi, this is uh, Rich G. I am a uh, senior business development director in our uh, in Red Hat's global service provider group. Um, I've uh, been focused on uh, global telco type of ISV partnerships over over the years, and uh, most recently in the past uh, year, year and a half or so, focused on uh, kind of our uh, container and OpenShift type strategies uh, in the uh, telecommunications market here. Rush. Yeah, hey, my name is Suresh Krishnan. I'm the CTO of Kaloom. So I'm from a networking background. So I had like, uh, um, I had careers at Cisco and Ericsson prior to like uh, becoming the CTO of Kaloom. So it's been about like two and a half years. And we've been like working very closely with Red Hat um, uh, as like a partner in the telco space. And uh, recently we had uh, one of those like 5G functions that is like uh, based entirely on OpenShift. And uh, we talked about it a little bit at the Red Hat Summit, and we've been uh, putting together the VCO lab, and we had a like showcase here in uh, Shanghai as well, and NWC. That, that's what I'm here to talk about. So uh, tell us like what we did, and like you know how our system looks like, and uh, what kind of issues we face, and uh, like how uh, we made changes to Kubernetes, pretty much to make sure that uh, the right things get done. So that's kind of like the basic idea of the spe uh, of the talk itself. Uh, so Rich is going to like provide like the overall um, like you know situation and like in the put us in perspective. I'll talk a little bit about Kaloom and then um, at the end we'll open up for questions. Great, thanks to Rush, um, especially for uh, late night there in Shanghai at Mobile Congress this uh, this week. Um, so as we jump into the nice. agenda here, as Shuris said, um, I'll give kind of a, a general update on, wh on what we're seeing with uh, containers and OpenShift, for, especially for the telco networking kind of space. Um, just uh, you know, briefly touch on what type of uh, collaboration we've done with Kaloom. Uh, we've actually, I've actually started working with Kaloom almost three years ago when they were still in stealth mode. So we'll kind of identify why we started that, that and um, that hopefully will then kick off into uh, Shirash kind of covering again what uh, some of uh, some of the solutions and how they use containers and, and, and Kubernetes uh, and in particular the, the use case that we're seeing in uh, 5G for example. And then there, there'll be a lot of room for Q&A. Um, so I'll rush right through these. Um, so basically you know, even though we're going to focus on, kind of on the future trends, um, but we do want to do a bit of a sanity check, right, uh, in terms of the evolution uh, on NFE here. Uh, probably most of you have seen the um, CNSCF Linux Foundation slides that show the future state, uh, actually without OpenStack, uh, where Kubernetes on bare metal is the single underlying substrate or under cloud, um, and that orchestrates both uh, VNFs and uh, with Kubert and cloud native network functions, right? So whether you call it the container native functions, containerized network functions, cloud native network functions, you know, in general, we're talking about CNFs here, or move from VNFs to CNFs here. Um, now, what, um, you know, we're, we have uh, product managers that, you know, we'd be happy to have set up, set you up with to discuss, you know, how we plan to get uh, to that state, that future state uh, that, that CNCF has, has, up, has been out there uh, kind of um, presenting as a future vision. And, and that's certainly a, a critical path uh, to the future, especially uh, for, for edge uh, use cases that we're seeing. Um, but, but it's probably worth noting that, that, you know, the reality in the market today is that there's been a lot of time spent already in um, you know, network function virtualization, the infrastructure for that. And so it will take um, you know quite some time for for the move from VNFs to CNFs and, and mass deployment of CNFs um, and the installed base of uh, of OpenStack for network function virtualization uh, and VNFs uh, will actually even be in place for for a much even longer time, right? So so we do believe that um, to really address the market needs, we need to provide choice 
of both a mature OpenStack uh, platform and a next generation platform based on OpenShift, right, for, for our customers and partners. So just kind of wanted to, you know, kind of level set that a little bit. Um, go ahead, uh, Suresh, next slide, please. So, you know, where, where are we today in this evolution, right, in terms of uh, containers and Kubernetes in, in the network? Um, you know, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the prevalent use of OpenStack and um, the maturity of infrastructure network support, not only in OpenStack but in RHEL, has meant that most of the use cases do, uh, you know, will rely on the OpenStack and the cloud support, right? Uh, now, in the past six to nine months, we have definitely seen more specific uh, OpenShift interests from both customers and partners uh, to use containers and Kubernetes in the network. Um, we've noticed this in terms of distinct upkick, you know, across the board on POC discussions uh, on various network functions. Um, we had been seeing it in the core, but starting to see a lot of interest uh, in edge use cases. Um, we've even seen uh, more RFI requests, right, from the, uh, the telco customers putting out in the market requests for, uh, for kind of strategies and plans to move the containers. Uh, and so there's a sense that, uh, you know, they are also gearing up for, uh, say, moving from pilots, I'm POCs to pilots, say, for next calendar year, right? Uh, now, what we've been doing um, to prepare for this over the last, say, one and a half years or more in both OpenShift and OSAC is uh, we've been pushing the work to deliver uh, improved support for running OpenShift on OpenStack. Right. Also, containerizing many inter infrastructure interfaces in various communities. Um, at the same time, we've been pushing the uh, building of Kubernetes operators for day two operations to increase uh, automation, supportability, and scale for the telco ecosystem so that, they, that this helps prepare to leverage uh, container adoption and deployments, right? Because we know that in telco that, that uh, you know, these things are critical in terms of the actually you know, moving to the next step of realizing uh, the use of some of these emerging technologies. So, uh, and as I mentioned, the, the, the push from the newer use cases of edge and 5G, um, you know, those tend to bring more of a focus on running OpenShift, say, on bare metal. So you'll start seeing uh, from us better support for running OpenShift with OpenStack uh, kind of in the second half of this year, right? As opposed to on top of OpenStack, more all, you know, alongside of it, like, as you see here. Um, we, you know, we also know that uh, it's not just about running um, OpenShift on bare metal, right? That's not the only answer. Um, we need to uh, also accelerate the ecosystem work to bring infrastructure resource and platform enhancements along with data path and networking functionality over to Kubernetes to make it all more supportable. Um, you know, we learned this from our ecosystem work in uh, OpenStack and NFE, uh, that there were these critical and kind of implementation gaps that we required in, in Kubernetes to enable the network functions to move over and to and leverage uh, container technologies and platforms. So we'll talk a bit about that uh, here and um, also about how you can also you know participate in this process uh, to to move the ecosystem. So this is a special interest group here in OpenShift. So uh, you know no surprise uh, here, uh, the way that we do our work in terms of uh, moving the technologies and the platforms forward is uh, we, we work in the uh, special interest groups and work groups within Kubernetes, right? And um, you know that way we can kind of iterate. Uh, with the ecosystem partners and customers uh, in, each, in each of these areas and uh, you know, not bound, be bound by, say, perhaps a, uh, a process or release or other mechanism that's part of the, the larger Kubernetes environment, right? So uh, this was quite effective uh, in other communities and this is kind of how we're doing it here. And just to dive down a little bit to see how we've done this uh, or made progress specifically in networking on containers, um, we'll, we'll look at the networking work group, for example, and, and how we've kind of uh, gotten through that. Uh, next uh, slide there, Suresh. So um, here, if we look a bit deeper at the, uh, what you know, some of the work was in the Kubernetes networking uh, SIG this past year, um, th this was uh, covered, this slide here was covered, I think, in, in a previous uh, gathering. Um, I want to say probably about a little over six months ago. Uh, so we do need to update this with 
the release of uh, OpenShift 4.1, which is the most recent release uh, this past month. Um, but you can see that Multis uh, was a specifically supported solution that we're looking to get done, uh, and that was done in the network plumbing working group, for example. Um, so, you know, that was critical in terms of getting uh, the Kubernetes networking support that we needed and uh, the functionality we needed to support things like uh, multi-network support for, for VNS, for example. Um, additionally, we were in tech preview already for SROV CNI and for the device plugin. Right, so this is adjunct work that's also relevant uh, for network functions, for example, for example, and we expect to have that support later this year. Now we combine that with um, all the progress we've made on, you know, other known um, uh, enhancements that were required in terms of resource management and enhanced platform awareness features. We knew that was important for NFV, and so. You know, we've, put, we've been putting that into support in the OpenShift platform in particular uh, to, again, to support this move to CNFs. Um, so, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, basically, it, it's uh, the way we do this is not only in the SIGs and upstream, um, and obviously, you know, uh, folks like uh, Intel and ourselves and uh, Cisco, IBM, and others, but also getting other partners and telcos to participate is important, not only for providing code, but it's just as important to get real telco use cases and influence into the community and to help set that direction, right? And so I think the net net is you're seeing here that uh, a lot of the effort to iterate and to support the network functions, we can do it through the special interest groups, through uh, us putting OpenShift, and hopefully what you're seeing here is that we're putting a great effort in OpenShift to really be capable platform uh, for, for use in the network, um, which is really, you know, kind of the topic for today and why we, we're, we're talking to Kaloon. Um, I think the next slide there, please, Shabrash. So going back to the, um, the, the first slide where, you know, we, we talked a little bit about um, you know, kind of a future vision, right? So, so what is the longer, you know, longer term uh, future state, right? Um, you know, no surprise, we're, you know, we're gonna deliver that through, through OpenShift. Um, we'll be evolving um, the native infrastructure support for compute networking and storage resources so that we can orchestrate both virtualized and container application workloads uh, on the platform, right? We'll continue to drive operators for the applications and infrastructure to automate operations and for lifecycle management. Um, you know, as we move more on to a container-based technology, um, you know, we feel you know, our, our expertise and, our, and the, the things we can bring to the table in terms of uh, container Linux and um, the rail host for the infrastructure piece are gonna be critical uh, elements and of technology uh, to help this move forward in a, in a, in a supportable manner. Um, and uh, we have our version of uh, Qvert, which is called Container Network Virtualization, uh, for support of the, uh, the VM uh, application or virtualized applications. And that, uh, that work is, uh, tracks along with the work with Multis and SROV, for example. So I believe that's actually also in tech preview. Um, but again, we can set up more, uh, more details on that with the product managers uh, in future uh, sessions. Um, what I would note there is, and this is, you know, you'll notice this of, of many of the technologies we work on, um, a lot of the functionality and use cases initially are, are driven from the larger kind of enterprise use case community. Right, so, so going back to that plug I made earlier, right, it, it's really important for us to get customers and partners in the telco market and in these tech uh, interest groups to, to bring the actual telco use cases so we can iterate on, on, these, uh, on these efforts uh, to, to address more of those type of needs. Okay, Suresh, I think uh, if you can move to my last slide. Okay, and the, before we move on to, uh, you know, Kaloom's uh, deeper dive here, um, I wanted to kind of highlight, um, you know, why we started engaging with Kaloom a, a few years back in our joint partnership. Uh, um, you know, a lot of it started with uh, when we were talking to Kaloom a few years back, um, I think the discussion started with, um, with our telco group and um, Chris Wright, our CTO, um, and there was, uh, you know, there was a need to kind of collaborate on um, Linux, Linux kernel, um, 
uh, Kaloum had, had, had seen that they wanted to really focus on this kind of greenfield build of their solution based on leveraging um, the, the, the emerging technologies in Cuba and shift, right? And um, they were also very interested not only in um, working with us upstream on these various uh, things, but also collaborating in these special interest groups. All right, so that was really a good kind of joint collaboration um, strategy we had. Um, they were looking at pushing the envelope in terms of using Kubernetes and RHEL and networking use cases, which we were very interested in, in doing. Um, they were looking at, uh, in their products, to actually leverage our uh, platforms uh, in, in very unique ways. And we've seen that kind of play out here as they, and you'll see them talk about the edge use cases and 5G use cases and how they're, how they're uniquely using um, these technologies. Uh, and then open, uh, you know, ultimately our, our shared vision was uh, to have open platforms. Um, they've created hooks uh, for their product into our uh, platforms. And uh, for Red Hat, you know, we participated in a lot of projects, but there are a lot of other projects that we don't participate directly in. So, um, for example, uh, we're very interested in what Kaloum was look, looking at doing the emerging kind of uh, open source efforts and open programming language of, of P4. And so this was a way for us to participate in that without being directly involved in those projects, um, you know, working through partners in the ecosystem to really explore these uh, evolutions of these open platforms. So in a nutshell, that's, that's why we started working with Kaloum, um, again, over three years ago before uh, when they were still in stealth mode. And we're happy to say that they've, uh, you know, we've worked with them to basically go to come to market here um, very recently with their products. Uh, and just in the past uh, few months, we've done um, joint events and demonstrations and, and, uh, and, and such at Moro Congress in Barcelona. Uh, this this week in Mobile Mo Congress in Shanghai, uh, and also at our Red Hat Summit uh, last month. So, um, Shirash, um, you know, again, thanks for uh, the partnership up to date, and really excited to, uh, for you to talk about uh, what you've been seeing the last uh, few months uh, in this space and, and, and the fit of your solution and uh, the technologies we just talked about. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, so. So what are we doing? So what we started off building is really a software defined fabric. So by that we mean uh, a fabric, networking fabric that can be changed after it is deployed. And so that is like a key feature. So we wanted something that is programmable and open. Uh, and uh, so we, we had a few key features in mind when we started off with this. So first thing was it was like completely autonomous. So the basic fabric itself is like fully self discovering and self forming. So if you put in like the component switches together and just power it on, everything self discovers itself. And um, I, I can like talk about it in quite a bit of detail, but it's very complicated. Like when, um, uh, if you want to configure like OpenShift, which is what we use. So everything we do on the control plane of the fabric is fully containerized and runs in OpenShift. So if we don't have the basic underlying network connectivity, it becomes very difficult for us to uh, uh, boot the system. Right, like because um, uh, OpenShift to configure itself like kind of requires network connectivity, and we are actually bootstrapping the network connectivity. So it was like an interesting problem to solve, and that's like an hour stock pretty much. Like you know how we did it, like how we uh, started off with like the core OS in the bottom, and then like uh, built up the whole system. Um, but the basic idea is like we didn't want any kind of configuration just to have the system up and running, and we uh, we use IPv6 like auto configuration. Uh, for all the nodes to find themselves, like assign themselves addresses, form the um, connectivity, L3 connectivity underneath, and form the mesh. Uh, so that is like something we want to do fully in an automated fashion. Uh, second thing we want to do is like we wanted it to be fully virtualizable, which means that you could slice uh, any subset of ports sitting anywhere in the fabric and manage them independently. So uh, this this meant that we had to put like you know strong isolation requirements like on on the Kubernetes side as well as the um, um, the hardware side on the switches, and uh, it also meant we can have independent fabrics that can be managed differently. So if if you look at Rich's picture, right? So there's like a, a OpenStack uh, side and an OpenShift side, uh, which means that there's some subset of resources that are controlled by OpenStack 
and some subset that's controlled by OpenShift. And, and we kind of wanted these to be independent from each other. So you could have uh, what we currently call a tenant, right? Like uh, running OpenStack and one running OpenShift. And we really didn't want them to be um, stepping on top of uh, each other's uh, toes. So like we, we had like some serious isolation requirements where a, any kind of traffic on one slice doesn't affect any traffic on the other slice. Uh, and, and we had some very weird requirements from some of our telco customers and also some data center customers uh, which said like, hey, we want the complete entire namespace for each of the slices. So if you have like VLAN ID uh, 33 in one slice, it should be a different network than VLAN ID 33 in another slice, even if it's on the same switch. So, uh, so those kind of things like kind of gave us like quite a bit of um, um, interesting thought on how we do the slicing. And, and at the end, like uh, we've done demos where um, we have part of the system running OpenStack, part of the uh, system running OpenShift. That's kind of what we demoed here as well. So that's kind of like a design requirement that uh, we recognize, like just like Rich said, that uh, even though containers are the future, the, the VM-based loads are not going away anywhere soon. So there's going to be a long tail of like VM-based loads. And so we want to be able to support everything independently. And the third thing is like um, uh, when Rich talked about P4, uh, the idea is like we can program the fabric in the field. Okay, so we want we move to a DevOps kind of model. So like you know in in, in the Kubernetes community, uh, in even in the OpenShift community, which is not really telco side, like on the enterprise side and and pretty much like most of the consumers there, um, uh, the DevOps model is very very prevalent. But the telco model is more uh, based on like you know having stable releases like at long periods and probably not even updating very much when things are working. And the idea was uh, we wanted to bring in the DevOps kind of model into networking. Uh, and this is not like, uh, don't think of this as like, you know, we kind of put in like feature updates all the time, but um, we need to keep things up to date. So when like there's some protocol fixes, there's like new options coming in, we didn't want to like redo the hardware, okay? But to instead of do, uh, doing like, you know, hardware like forklift upgrades, we wanted to have a software patch that'll add in the new functionality or new protocols. And the fourth thing we want to do is like accelerate the data plane. So this is again like um, when we started working with Red Hat, like you know we are, we were looking at like you know virtual switches. So we looked at OVS, and uh, we said okay, like you know OVS has some uh, limitations. It consumes like a lot of CPU on the on the computer. So like what can we do to optimize it? So we have our own virtual switch that we um, um, we we are benchmarking along with Red Hat, uh, where we try to offload uh, most of the processing onto the leaf switch that's attached. So this gives us like quite a bit of uh, uh, CPU optimization, right? Like we, we can offload, uh, let's say instead of eight cores, like uh, doing DPDK stuff, we can uh, cut it down to like one core and do all the processing on the fabric itself. And it also gives us like significant performance and latency benefits in there. And uh, we also have, uh, since we have a programmable fabric, we can have additional network functions that are getting hosted. So first things we start off, we started putting like a virtual switch in there. Uh, we started putting a virtual router. So we have BGP and OSPF running in the fabric itself, the data plane. And we also have a VXLAN gateway. So like, so if you wanted to have uh, L3 network virtualization, we able, we're able to support it directly in the uh, fabric hardware itself. And, and while going down this direction, uh, that's when we started like building the uh, user plane function, which is the UPF for 5G. I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail because that's kind of the focus of the presentation, but that's kind of where we start off. Like what can we have um, as part of the fabric? Like the fabrics um, had to come into the, let's say the 21st century uh, and start doing things that are uh, useful for telcos for doing network functions. And, and one of the key features is like we never wanted to do any hardware. So we have um, tie-ups with like top white box uh, networking vendors, and we want to be able to run on like pretty much any of them. So Acton is like our uh, closest partner. Like most of our shipments, like we've been doing, is like with Acton. But we also have certified uh, stuff on Delta, Foxconn, and Inventec as well uh, from white boxes. So the um, whoever's a customer is able to pick uh, who's uh, who's the ODM vendor they want to buy from, and we just certify on top of the hardware. So uh, starting off with the programmable data plane, um, as I talked about a little bit, so we want to add new features and services at runtime without affecting the traffic. And uh, we want to have um, 
like innovation in the network, like to develop like new code and new protocols and allow like new kind of business models. And um, so another key thing, which is not technical thing, but uh, more like a philosophy thing, is like we want to avoid vendor lock-in, even if it's for ourselves. So somebody should be able to use uh, our system as a platform and add additional P4 code to do networking functions, which means that the customer can program something themselves or they can go to a third party to get like a P4 uh, piece of code that can run on our fabric and provide the functionality. And, and the reason we pick P4 is like this is something that's like um, uh, industry standard, like it's supported by um, lo a lot of players in the industry and it's uh, now under the Linux Foundation networking umbrella. So like we, we believe that's, that this is the right language to um, um, uh, do this kind of hardware independent and uh, high level pro packet programming. So um, just to like uh, like for, for on the telco space, right? This is kind of like how things look like on the left today. So we have a bunch of networking functions that are sitting on multiple servers, and and each of the networking functions like pretty much have their own control plane and data plane in a monolithic fashion. So the packet comes in, in into one of the servers, it does like one piece of the function, uh, ships it back into the fabric, and so on. And the fabric is like a fixed function um, ASIC based fabric. So this is pretty much like anything you can see in the market today. So based on like a, a Broadcom Tomahawk kind of thing or a Trident kind of chipset. And like everything is done uh, pretty much on the x86. And if you see, there's like a few issues, right? So the packet comes in, in and out, so which means that you're using a lot of back-to-back uh, -back bandwidth on the fabric. So it kind of reduces the performance. And every time a packet gets in and out of a server, um, like uh, I, I sit like greater than 20 microseconds, but it's more about like 50 to 80 microseconds of latency introduced every time a packet goes in and out. And if you look at like, you know, a lot of applications in 5G that claim to need uh, one millisecond latency, if you go through five functions, you're probably at like 300, 400 uh, microseconds of latency already consumed in the uh, network processing chain. So uh, that doesn't leave much for radio and for any other application processing stuff. So uh, we wanted to reduce this quite significantly. So what we did is we separated the control plane and, and the data plane of the network functions and, and hosted them directly in the fabric. So that's really the goal is to make sure that when the packet comes in into the fabric, it stays in the fabric in, in most of the cases, the user plane itself. The control plane, we didn't want to move it because like it had quite a few not born interfaces. Every operator has like their already their workflow engines, their orchestration systems. So it becomes very difficult to disentangle this piece. So we wanted to keep all the control functions and the not born interfaces identical while offloading the data plane processing directly into the fabric. Okay, so this gives us like quite a few benefits, right? So we have better performance. We can uh, push packets out at a higher throughput. Uh, we have much lower latency. And, and the third thing, which is like very interesting is that we save quite a bit of CPU um, uh, utilization in, in, the, in all of the servers. So as I said before, um, uh, a server doing uh, 100 gig of throughput uh, using DPTK is probably using eight cores and we can cut it down to like a core by just like uh, switching out the data plane out and just using it for control to data plane interactions. So this is like a, a depiction of like, you know, how we split up the fabrics. And um, there's like just one thing I want to do. I don't want to do this in too much detail. So um, uh, every physical fabric, we can split it into multiple uh, virtual fabrics. That's like a common use case. Like, you know, people say, hey, like I want to split up and, and virtualize and, and provide the uh, stuff to multiple tenants. So that's like a common thing today. But like the other thing that we have done is like taken a virtual fabric and span it across multiple physical data centers. So um, so this like came about because like we had like a lot of operator customers uh, who are like building out quite a bit of edge data centers and they want to manage them in a unified fashion. So if, if you look at this picture here, if you have a centralized data center called Fabric, which has Fabric One and a distributed data center, uh, which is like an edge data center, which is like far out and there's like thousands of them. Uh, so a Fabric Two is an example. You could have a fabric that spans, virtual fabric that spans across uh, both the central data center and a remote data center, which means that you can allocate uh, compute or networking uh, functions uh, depending on where you want them to be. So you could have, uh, if you want like low latency, you could um, put some server uh, resources on, on a remote data center and you can move them back to a centralized data center if you want more throughput or if you want like a um, like better utilization. So this gives you like unprecedented um, 
uh, scalability uh, as one and the flexibility on where you put those things. So that's something like that's why we wanted to separate the physical uh, manifestation of the fabric from the actual virtual one, which actually people use. Okay, so each of the V fabrics can be controlled by a different orchestrator. In our case, we are like uh, supporting uh, Red Hat OpenStack and uh, OpenShift pretty much to uh, sit on top of these. So that's kind of what uh, Rich was talking about. So we are like already ML2 certified with uh, OpenStack 13 and also the RCNI is also like, you know, fully tested with OpenShift. And so like one of the examples like we were using is like yeah. uh, when you have a virtual fab, yeah, did you have? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Did you have a question? No, no, no I'm good. I'm sorry. I just uh, unmuted by mistake. Hey, no worries. Thanks. So, um, so the idea was like, you know, each of the V fabrics like can be a foggy slice. So you could have a uh, slice that spans multiple. So if you look at this picture here, you have like access nodes, you have the edge data centers and centralized data centers, and you could have a slice that goes across multiple um, uh, physical locations. And you could use like one for like, let's say uh, we are seeing some cases in Asia where there's like network sharing. Okay, so like we were talking to somebody in Singapore and they were like actually trying to share the spectrum and have like some kind of network sharing. And we have the same thing in Canada where um, like Bell and Telus, right? Like they have some kind of network sharing arrangements. So if, if we can implement those kind of things by having a virtual fabric that's totally isolated um, and say like, hey, like each operator gets like a piece of like resources. And so th think of it as an MENO, but like really uh, all the way across the network, right? And you could um, take, um, let's say another slice and give it to somebody like Tesla, right? Like, or some car manufacturer, and they could do like, their own end-to-end uh, -end slice over the network, and they can have full control of it and what runs in the data plane of those things. So that's kind of the idea is like you uh, have a complete slice end-to-end -end, uh, in the 5G network, and everybody gets independent ownership of their resources. So what is the column UPF? So I'm not sure like how much like you're familiar with the 5G network, but um, to give you a short introduction, the 5G user plane function, uh, if you take the packet gateway, the, the PDN gateway in, in LTE, uh, what 3GPP decided to do is to split the control plane piece and the user plane piece. And they did a project called CUPS, like uh, control user plane separation. And, and they took out the user plane function and put it as a separate uh, virtual function. And we have implemented the, uh, the whole user plane function inside uh, the barefoot Tofino switch that we have uh, fully written in P4, okay? So we want it to be highly scalable and it's very, very low latency. So we can get a packet in and out uh, with the full uh, mobile processing in about 500 nanoseconds. So it's like very, very quick. It's a, probably like a couple of orders of magnitude faster than doing it on an x86. And on a single um, node that we showed here, we, we were doing like about 2.7 terabit of throughput. Uh, while compared to an x86, the fastest one we've seen is about 200 uh, gigabit. So it's about, again, 15-fold uh, uh, increase in uh, throughput. And, and also, like, other than latency and throughput, the power consumption is also, like, way lower. Um, uh, so pretty much for 3 terabit of traffic, uh, we consume about the same power as, like, what is consumed for 200 gigabit of traffic, right? And we can scale this up pretty high um, to millions of sessions um, uh, on the user side. And we are targeting uh, multiple use cases. So since we are like scalable pretty much linearly um, by adding like more UPF nodes, uh, we are targeting the large regional data centers where like everything is concentrated. But we're also like the, the main kind of use cases we are seeing right now is like people are trying to use something like this for an edge data center where like there's like, you know, probably uh, tens of base stations or like, you know, hundreds of base stations that are getting uh, 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 like aggregated really, right? So every 5G base station is like pu pushing out about 20 gig of throughput. And so like if you do like, you know, 15 or 20 of them, like, you know, it becomes like 400 gig, right? So it becomes like pretty difficult uh, to like handle this all in the x86. And um, also like, it's quite a bit of, uh, since you're at the edge data center, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, limitations on the real estate and power. So people want to minimize uh, how much real estate they use in there. Um, if they have like only two racks, they want to be used it for applications like that can be charged for rather than their own network functions. And so this is like kind of like showing this in the um, um, 
uh, in the network pretty much, right? The UPF uh, sits between uh, the base station, which like I call the RAN here, and, and the, uh, the internet side, right? Like, so the N6 is where um, uh, the data flows to the internet pretty much. And you can also do like a roaming uh, connection to another operator, but like most of the stuff we are seeing is really like non-roaming scenarios because most people are in pretty early phases of 5G deployment. So people are doing the trials and do like small deployments. So we've seen some deployments in, in Asia, in Seoul, and uh, so we've seen some in, in North America as well. Like so um, uh, people have like limited uh, trial deployments. And uh, one of the interesting things that also came out is like a lot of people are doing 5G for fixed access. So think of it as like more uh, G-Pond replacement rather than the classic mobile use case, but we are seeing both of them happening. But um, in North America, like it's mainly uh, fixed 5G that's like um, seems to be deployed a bit more. So looking at like, you know, how this works like in reality. So like I've been like pretty abstract about like, you know, how this thing works. So uh, our fabric itself is like a folded clause topology leaf spine fabric. And uh, the UPF data plane itself is implemented in, on the leaf switches. So uh, we can, uh, so since it's like a P4 piece of code, right? We can actually use it as part of the fabric or we can have a UPF as an appliance, which is pretty much our leaf switch. We just ship it off and uh, it can be connected to an existing fabric. And, and so all our stuff, all our control plane runs in a cluster of x86 servers. And everything, all of these things is, are running uh, OpenShift, okay? So uh, we, we had pretty much like uh, Red Hat Atomic, Rel Atomic running on all of these switches and we are moving everything to CoreOS and running everything in an OpenShift cluster. So the main idea of this is like the, the control plane can be scaled based on how much messaging we need. Okay, so if you have a lot of messaging needs, we have a lot of control plane functions, you can scale this. And we wanted something that's reliable and modern. And that's why we decided to do everything as containers. So if you look at all the virtual router stuff or BGP functions, everything is running as containers. So like they can be run uh, on the switches, they can be run on the controller servers, okay? And a lot of the latency sensitive functions, they're running on the switches itself. The switches have an x86 that's running um, rel core OS, and uh, that's where we run the containers themselves. And the control plane functions of the uh, 5G network itself, so that's the AMF, SMF, they run on application servers that are connected in the front ports of the fabric. So why did we pick um, um, like OpenShift and, and CoreOS, right? The idea is like we wanted uniformity. So we wanted uh, some, some customers to have the same kind of operating system they can run on the compute, the storage, and the networking, which means that like that rules out any kind of like uh, our NOS pretty much that we write ourselves. And uh, we wanted like good security features. We wanted like easy uh, upgrades and rollbacks and everything. So if you wanted an update, let's say uh, for meltdown aspect, we should be able to deploy it in a matter of minutes rather than a uh, matter of years. And we wanted to have a light operating system, uh, which is made for container platforms pretty much. So that's why we went with CoreOS. We didn't do the uh, classic rel. And uh, so, and that's pretty much it. And a and lot of people, have gone the other way on the networking side. Everybody has their own networking operating system. So if you look at it, there's like um, uh, quite a few examples of those. And the idea is like, you know, they don't have like a large footprint and they don't have like a lot of the security features and and pretty much like the updating is like uh, pretty slow. So if you look at like, a lot of the network Linuxes, like they are gonna be updated probably like six months or a year later than um, like Rel gets an update, right? So if, if you look at Meltdown or Spectre or something. So that's kind of the uh, important thing. And also like if you look at the um, uh, Run-C vulnerability that came out a few months ago, like OpenShift was the only thing that was not affected, right, uh, by that. So like we are, like that's why we decided that like, you know, we didn't want to spend our time and effort on maintaining the operating system and the updates and we'll rather focus on the networking piece itself, okay? And this, this might like, you know, um, um, be very different approach, but I think it's the right approach to go to uh, do the stuff. So if you, uh, if you think of it in a different way, the, uh, the, the switches that we have in our system, they act like any other server right? with like a really, really uh, large NIC. That's how you can think about it in another way. So that's uh, once we started that kind of thinking, then everything just fell into place and, and we got the stuff working. So, uh, and when we did everything with containers, right, we realized like quite a few, um, um, 
how would call it how how should I call it like sh uh, shortcomings on the uh, uh, Kubernetes side for the uh, networking. So like uh, Kubernetes was made for uh, a lot of the L7 workloads that are very common in a lot, lot of the big application providers. But once we start going into like you know multiple networking support and stuff like that, which is very common in telco environments, like you know uh, we had we found like quite a few things were missing. So we started working on with like you know the uh, the Multus folks and uh, like a lot of the folks at Red Hat. Uh, to make sure that we started improving the CNI and started pushing things back. And as Rich talked about, there's like a network plumbing working group under uh, SIG network, and that's where we started doing quite a bit of the work. And um, so we we put this into our CNI. The, our CNI is called Cactus. So a bunch of the stuff, like you know, we kind of started putting in things into uh, the uh, specifications really into the uh, network plumbing, but we also release all the source code uh, pretty much into open source. And our goal is to make sure that uh, pretty much any change we make uh, goes upstream into Multus, and then it's going to get pulled in into uh, OpenShift in the future. Okay, and and the biggest differences I think we make is like you know we really want uh, to be able to have multiple networking support in in Kubernetes and with dynamic lifecycle. So if you have a routing container and you want to bring up an interface, right now Kubernetes the only way to do it is like to kill and restart the pod, and that's not really uh, very useful in a telco environment where 24-7 uh, availability is required. So we were thinking like we need to do something dynamic you know, how we actually discover new connectivity and, and provision it. So like we are we have something called a pod agent that we uh, developed that looks out for changes in annotations and it can hook up and, and remove network connectivity on the fly. Okay, so um, I it, you can download the slides at some point, Diane. Right? So, like, um, so we I have the URL there, so you can go take a look at our source code, and um, uh, you know, like, contribute stuff back, or if you have any questions, like, um, please send us a note. So, um, so uh, one of so it's like we're kind of running out of time, so I just wanted to make sure that I tell you about like some stuff we are doing along with Red Hat and and the Linux Foundation as well. So, uh, Linux Foundation has this um, effort that's called Virtual Central Office. So there's going to be um, something called Virtual Central Office 3.0, and that's going to be based uh, on uh, pretty much uh, CNFs, right? Like uh, it's going to be testing uh, containerized network functions pretty much, and uh, as opposed to like the earlier versions of VCO that were more uh, VM-based. So uh, we have uh, we are putting together a couple of labs. We put together one in Montreal and uh, one in Shanghai now. So that's something we showed this week, and the idea is like we keep um, the, the column fabric sits in there, but we are really open to like getting any other kind of workload. So if you're like either a telco vendor or an operator who wants to try things out, uh, this will be like a really, really good place to uh, test it out. So bring, bring in your application, you can put it in the lab. So we have like a whole bunch of servers that are um, pretty much donated by the Lenovo and a bunch of switches from Acton. They're all running the column software right now. And uh, this is something that's open for pretty much uh, anybody um, like a Red Hat partner or Linux Foundation member to come and participate. So just to put in your load, see how things work out, see how we interoperate with everybody. So that's pretty much um, like uh, one of the things I want to call out. So we're pulling two of these together. So one in APAC and uh, one in North America. And there's also a third one that's coming up in Europe like um, as well with the open air interface. So you can actually test out uh, with the radio side. And this is kind of how our system looks like. And uh, uh, so it's like, if you remember, like Rich's picture is like very, very uh, similar to it. But if you look at it, like, you know, we had like, you know, OpenStack sitting underneath, like uh, configuring everything for us for the OpenShift. And uh, so we had like our UPF control function, which is the, uh, the northbound interface of the packet function. And we can have other containers network functions that are directly sitting under OpenShift. But we also have some of the functions that are running under as VMs uh, under OpenStack. So uh, that was the demo we did here, where we had part of the pieces of stuff running in OpenShift and the rest of the stuff running in OpenStack. So that kind of like uh, fits well into the uh, coexistence vision that Rich was talking about. So um, any questions in here, or like um, I'm, I'm pretty open to talking about anything. So feel free to ask. Um, actually, since uh, we have any questions there, um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll kind of throw one up for, for Suresh um, and maybe put him on a spot a little bit too, right? Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things we found over the last, you know, few years here is that even though we went into it 
identifying that we knew we had certain things we wanted to accomplish with containers, networking, open shift, what have you. You know, you really don't know what you don't know, right, until you get into it. And, and it's interesting that I think we were able to uh, to apply uh, some of these things in areas we never would have perhaps expected, you know, upfront. Um, you know, containers for high performance networking and low latency, like like how Kaloom's uh, working it. Um, there is one area that I think uh, Shuresh is being a uh, actually I think you're still the triple uh, IEEE uh, chair for IPv6, Shuresh. Um, do you see that? Uh, I know that's one of the things we're working on longer term. Do you see that being an issue right now um, for people to start looking at this stuff? Uh, and how do you see that uh, playing? That, that comes up as a question every so often with with our operators, right, in terms of IPv6 IP. support. Yep. yep. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that's happened is, right, so um, when we started off, like, uh, Kubernetes had, like, very poor IPv6 support. And then after we started working on it, Kubernetes got pretty good IPv6 support. But uh, the big issue is that, right, like, you cannot do v4 and v6. Okay, so you had to pick one. So, like, Kubernetes, like, uh, can do v4 only or v6 only. So that's like one thing that's kind of missing is the dual stack support for Kubernetes and that's coming pretty soon. So like um, uh, I saw quite a bit of uh, like, you know, PRs coming in uh, for the uh, dual stack support. Uh, we missed the last release of Kubernetes, but I, I think in the next release, like we should have uh, quite a bit of uh, 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 dual stack support in Kubernetes itself. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. I mean, I think we, you know, we had kind of the same feelings on Multis, you know, whatever, a year, year and a half ago, and we've seen it come to fruition now. So hopefully we'll see uh, more of that on on these type of uh, enhancements and functionalities that, that we hear about. Right. Right. And, and we are, like, entirely V6 only inside the fabric itself. So, like, you know, we didn't see a lot of the issues. But um, I, I would see, like, as, like, somebody who's going to use it as an end user, as an operator, they would certainly have v4-only loads, like there's like still stuff um, that's v4-only, like, and I, I, I think it's like the dual stack support for Kubernetes. I would say probably in the next couple of months, they, it should be around, uh, for sure. Great. Uh, and any thoughts on, uh, I meant, oops, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt after you. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was, yeah, please, please go ahead. I, I, yeah, I was just going to ask him, Suresh, if what he's been seeing the last six months in terms of increase in PLCs, what have you, but uh, you can answer that, uh, 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 you know, later. Please please go ahead and ask the question. Before. Sure. So, so, Suresh, the question I had was, uh, I did see the, about the fabric, and it's perfectly suited for leaf spine. I was wondering, is it, uh, is, the, is the routed network based uh, on IP multicast, or do you have your own proprietary stuff like uh, the Cisco guys? Uh, so the, the the router network is pretty much like standard BGP OSPF, right? So we what we have done is like you know um, the routing tables are spread out through the system. So we have a distributed table and which allows us to scale. So like you know we're not replicating the routing tables in all the all the switches. So we have a distributed routing table and uh, we have an algorithm by which we figure out where the uh, router is uh, stored, right? And 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 the control plane itself is running as a container under OpenShift. So like you know anybody looking from the outside. Will just see the container uh, running the BGP or OSPF. So the the peer the BGP control plane itself is sitting on the container. So and uh, so does that answer your question, Vijay, or did you want something more? Yeah, that's 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 basically what we wanted to know. Thanks. Okay, cool. So um, uh, so like uh, so going to Rich's point, right? So we've seen quite a bit of interest. Like when when we started off, like talking to operators, like you know quite a few. Um, like I would say like about a year and a half ago, right? When we, before we had a product, we started talking to people and everybody was still like on the uh, VM track, right? So there was not like much uptake for containers. And uh, like, and most of the people we were talking to were running like, no, like a RHOSP 10 or something like that, right? Like, uh, so they were like pretty, and, and we decided like pretty early. So we had like some <laughs> nice uh, talks with like Rich and like, you know, uh, like Mark Russell and like a lot of the Red Hat people. And we decided at that point to go to like OpenStack 13 and and uh, uh, to do the certification. So our ML2, uh, we decided to go on the ML uh, on the OpenStack 13 platform, and that's something we have seen quite a bit. Like you know, a lot of people are moving over from uh, 10, which is the last uh, long-term release, to 13, which is the latest one. Uh, so that's one thing. But we've seen quite a bit of interest on the container side. So we've seen like a lot of customers picking up OpenShift 
uh, and uh, so like I uh, like you like I think the De the Bell deal was announced already in uh, in uh, Red Hat Summit, so I can talk about it. So so Bell is like a um, big operator in Canada, and they're like go going like quite a bit with OpenShift. So like they're really interested in like all the CNI stuff, and uh, we have like a trial ongoing with them, like which is pretty much testing out a lot of the things I'm talking about right now. So they have the edge data center use case, they have containers and they want to see our CNI improvements and our latency improvements. That's kind of like, uh, that's one of them. And we have quite a few trials ongoing in Asia and all of them have a uh, container component. So the, the, I would say the, at least at the, at a trial level, the um, adoption of container seems to be ongoing. And most people have, um, I would say, embraced containers as like the way forward to go through and like, you know, doing microservices and things like that. So that's kind of like where we're going next, right? So see how, um, like, you know, we do the um, service mesh kind of thing, how we do the microservices, that would be the next step. And, and Vijay, like, I know you worked on the Skydive stuff, right? So that's something, that's some kind of thing where we can actually look at the visibility of the network. So we had to see how we can integrate something like that uh, in there so we can um, get the uh, deep visibility into the network. Perfect. I think uh, two questions to you, Suresh. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, with offload, as I understand, uh, it, it appears to be that you guys have 100% offload and there is no slow path. Um, is that right? I mean, the, uh, uh, you're not like the net, like other smart NIC vendors like Mellanox or they use TC floor to actually offload, but looks like you guys are always in the in the fabric. Uh, for, for, the, uh, for, for the functions we support, yes, right? Because like yes. uh, we see two things, right? Because there's service chains that can be there that we don't support stuff in, right? So like, for example, if somebody wants to do some encryption decryption right like we cannot do it today in in the fabric because we don't just have the hardware so if somebody wants to do like an ipsec tunnel termination we just cannot do it so we we have plans for a next generation leaf switch where we'll be able to do more functions but as long as the function is implemented by us it's a hundred percent offload like you said exactly right and uh Suresh, the next question i had was uh barefoot themselves have a product called deep insight um yeah which was like uh, uh, you could actually timestamp every packet in, packet out, getting in and out of the fabric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering, you know, flow key, flow I, mm -hmm. I, be, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, is it ex an extension of this or is it a completely something, you could have done something completely different? It's completely different because like barefoot only supports everything at the hardware level and we had to do analytics at the vFabric level. So we had to do like something different like from the scratch. So we used the capabilities of the barefoot chip itself but um, everything else is like ours. So we don't, it's not based on uh, deep inside. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah. you. It was a great yeah, presentation. I think uh, I really like that uh, the 100% uh, data plate uh, yeah. uh, kind of uh, uh, this thing because it gives us a lot of CPU budget and it, it keeps the whole deployment scenario quite easy. Perfect. Thank you very much, Vijay. Thanks. So Vijay, um, I think I, I heard some a, a topic that I, I didn't know much about um, that you were working on. It was was it called Service Dash that you just mentioned, Suresh? Sky, Sky Dive. Oh, Sky, Sky Dive. Dive. Sky Dive is a is a, a tool within Red Hat, and uh, I'm the engineering manager for that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that sounds like something that might be a future topic for a telco uh, meeting, um, as as this is it's a new topic to me. So, sure. I will hit we, you. We can talk. You yeah, off. definitely. Yeah. That would be great, um, and and then um, more. I think around um, where Kubernetes is going in the feature features and functions that um, that from the telco point of view and from Kalum's point of view that we need to help support in Kubernetes would be um, a nice um, second follow-on talk topic as well. So um, we are at the top of the hour. So thank you everybody for your questions and for participating. Um, I will send out uh, if. Shiresh, if you send me a link to your presentation, I'll, I'll upload it um, as a PDF and link it to a blog post for blog.openship.com. So you'll find it there and put it up on our YouTube channel um, along with the video from today. And um, if any of you have topics that you wanna talk about, we always meet on the fourth Friday of every month, which I can't think of, calculate out what it is this coming month um, at 8 a.m. Um, Pacific. So um, we're definitely looking for other speakers. Um, Shiresh, you mentioned Bell and TELUS and a whole number of other folks, um, and myself being in Canada, I recognize both of those names. So 
maybe we can get some of them to come on and um, tell how they're using Kaloom um, on some of their use cases for the edge as well. So um, thanks again, everybody, for coming, Richard. And um, we'll uh, let you go to sleep now, Shiresh, um, somewhere in China, or travel on a plane overnight and get the red eye. But, um, uh, safe travels to everybody. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.